seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey! Well, welcome. I'm Reverend Jay Wolin, the settled minister here at the Unitarian Universalists of Sarasota. We are so uh, proud to, to be able to participate in this event. One of our principles is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. Yes. In our congregations and society at large, I really want to thank our sponsors today, Florida Veterans for Common Sense, Floridians for Democracy, and Choose Democracy Now. Let's give them a round of applause. And since it is Veterans Day and this is still a church, I would like to say, uh, well, a religious organization, um, I would like to uh, just say a little prayer for Veterans Day, uh, especially think of all the veterans, also my own uh, grandfather in World War I, my father in the Korean War, my uncle in the Vietnam War. And so I invite us to relax and to open our hearts spirit of life and love we are grateful for the service of those those for the service of those who uh, and all who have served in our armed services protected us from harm defended our freedom may we always be faithful to them as they return home to us just as they made commitments for us may we remember our commitments to them and as they provide a peace for us, we hope that they be provided peace of mind. All this I ask and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. And now I just want to let you know our services are Sunday morning at 1030. You are all welcome to be here. <laughs> and now I would, I'm very excited to invite up um, Jean Jones from uh, Veterans for Common Sense. There's a one technical issue that I've been asked, and that is if you have your cell phones on, please turn them off. Appreciate that. I am Gene Jones, president of Florida Veterans for Common Sense, and we thank Reverend Woolen, and we so appreciate the Unitarian Universalist for allowing us to use this beautiful campus. Let's hear it. We thank our co-sponsors, Choose Democracy Now! and Floridians for Democracy for their support in organizing this event and for the exhibitors today at the Expo, and that's really appreciated. We hope each of you found, the, found at the Expo a group that you can pitch in and support, because there's a lot of good causes out there today. The highlight of our today's Veteran Day activities is going to be the talk by Professor Ruth Bingiat. She is a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. She writes about fascism, authoritarianism, propaganda, and democracy protection. She is the recipient of the Guggenheim and other fellowships, an advisor to protect democracy, and an MSNBC opinion columnist. She appears frequently on MSNBC, PBS, and other networks. Her latest book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the present examines how illiberal leaders use corruption, violence, propaganda, and machismo to stay in power. As a public intellectual, she writes a newsletter on Substack she calls Lucid. It is not unusual for pundits to write a newsletter, but Dr. Benjot does more. She hosts a weekly Zoom for her paid Lucid subscribers, which she comments on cur current events and answers questions. We recommend Lucid. I know I look forward to it. I look forward to her commentary every week. Dr. Ben Giot is a democracy defender. She consulted with the January 6th committee and is willing to speak truth to power. If the authoritarians take power in America, there's no doubt she'll be at the top of the hit list. As veterans, her courage to speak out makes us proud. 
Last year, we presented our annual Thomas Paine Award to Congressman Jamie Raskin. In his acceptance speech, he commented how surprised he was to find in Sarasota a hotbed of MAGA authoritarianism, a veterans group, and he char characterized our area as the belly of the beast. Now, we have right here in the belly of the beast a foremost democracy defender who we promise will give the beast indigestion. Please give a hearty Sarasota welcome to one of our favorite commentators, Dr. Ruth Benjiat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a lovely introduction, and I'm so happy to be here uh, to speak to you all, and thank you for the groups that uh, brought me here. I'm especially honored to speak to veterans and their allies on this Veterans Day weekend. I imagine that few or none of you uh, anticipated a situation in which the elite of one of our two major parties conspired to overthrow the government and turned against the armed forces and uh, attacked the Capitol Police. Nor did you probably think it was a likely scenario that a US president would cultivate what I call um, a personal army of thugs and incite them to assault the Capitol, a, a temple of democracy, and then later uh, to suggest that it would be OK if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, if something happened to him or he would be executed. I imagine none of us saw this coming. And now, as you know well, the GOP is actively engaging in uh, sabotage, uh, not only of American uh, stability at home, but American power and influence abroad, with Senator uh, Tommy Tuberville uh, continuing to hold up hundreds of military promotions and Senator Rand Paul obstructing um, diplomatic appointments, and this is, these are related. So all of this is disgraceful and disrespectful to all who have risked their lives for this country. So I'd like to thank you and your families and, um, on this Veterans Day weekend. So the title that was given to the talk um, is Fascism at Our Doorstep. Um, so that's something we will consider. To assess that, we should start with an understanding of what fascism is, and also how it can look different today. Um, so uh, Robert Paxton, a historian uh, uh, retired from Columbia University, um, came up with one of the longest and most complete definitions of fascism. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's, it's really long. But he says, everybody's sure they know what fascism is. So some of the things he listed, and there's other people who have checklists, um, obsessive preoccupation with decline, like grievance, uh, humiliation or victimhood, and we'll come back to that, um, uh, hyper-nationalism, and the abandon, total abandon of the idea of democratic liberties, redemptive violence, um, when someone says, I'm your retribution, uh, that's redemptive violence, and the absence of ethical uh, and legal restraints. And I will add that we think of authoritarianism as um, controls on people, and it is that. But some people will have more freedoms than they ever, ever dreamed, because another part of it is to roll back regulations against plundering the environment, plundering bodies, the workforce, so freedom for some and controls for others. So we can, uh, the first slide, good. So I like this simple definition of fascism that was uh, coined by Mussolini, who was a great sloganeer who founded fascism, a revolution of reaction. Now fascism originally came out of the upheaval of World War I. It started as a decentralized militia movement in the countryside, and that's important. Many of the early members were veterans who didn't or couldn't demobilize. And so Mussolini made sure they didn't have to demobilize. 
they basically brought the war home and turned their wrath, turned their violence on lots of domestic enemies. <clears throat> so that's part of the revolution of reaction. And these were leftists. Um, Mussolini had been a socialist, and he got kicked, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he was kicked out of the Socialist Party for supporting World War I, um, but also liberal politicians, including progressive and liberal priests. We don't hear about that, but the, the fascist black shirts beat up and killed uh, priests. Um, eventually, ethnic minorities, women, uh, gays, and eventually Italian Jews as well. All of these people were targets of uh, the turning the war against your own citizens. So the revolution part is also that fascists want to create upheaval and chaos. They want to destroy the existing domestic and political and domestic and international order. So today we hear about, you know, they're against uh, the UN and the EU and NATO, and if Trump comes back, he will try and pull America out of NATO. Um, then it was the League of Nations that was the enemy. At the same time, they want to turn the clock back on progress, on racial emancipation, gender equity, class, workers' rights. So that's the revolution of reaction. You have upheaval to then turn the clock back. So when do strongmen have an appeal? It's often when societies are in transition and have undergone a lot of social change and progress. Again, it could be uh, gender emancipation, racial emancipation, workers' rights. These things leave some feeling this is a jest and something to celebrate, and others feel that their rights and their status and their influence society is threatened. So you get backlash. So the revolution of reaction is a backlash, right? Always includes backlash. In the Euro-American context, my book is global, um, and it looks at authoritarian states that come in in the Congo and all over the world, in Libya. But in the Euro-American context, this has meant that white males feel particularly aggrieved. And uh, so they act with their allies to take away the rights of, of everybody else. And in the US, we were actually primed for a Trump to come, because there had been eight years of the first African-American president. Some people never accepted him during that time. Same-sex marriage was legalized. Women were admitted to combat. Um, and there was gen push for gender equity in the military. So all of this created an environment for a Trump to come in and say, I alone can fix it, meaning take all of, those, take all of that progress away if he can. So I see fascism along with early communism as the first stage in a broader history of authoritarianism. And my book, Strongmen, tells the history of these right-wing revolutions of reaction. Now, some people are disappointed when they open the book and they don't see Stalin, they don't see Chavez, they don't see Castro. And this is not because I think that communism was not as, as bloodthirsty as fascism. Communism created many more victims over a century. But I did not see a book that looked at fascism and then said, well, what happened in 1945 to all of that culture, all of that racial, those racial ideologies? So the book travels from fascism to the right-wing military coups of the Cold War and then on to the people today who are, you know, Bolsonaro. Trump is in the book. I had to kind of fight to get Trump included in the book. Um, is very important. And then people who used to be communists like Putin and Orban and are now uh, right-wingers. So that's the story that, that I uh, was telling. So authoritarian states have long claimed that they are efficient. They bring order. The streets will be clean. There'll be no homeless people who you don't want to see. There'll be no, um, you know, no kind of anarchy in society. And Mussolini had the thing where he said, the trains will run on time. So I wrote the book to debunk that and other myths. Because what authoritarianism does is bring ruin to societies. Um, they, they accelerate the climate. They plunder the environment. They plunder the workforce. They plunder businesses. And so if you know people who are very supportive of right-wing leaders because they think they're going to be you know, pro-business, 
this is why uh, Putin, Erdogan, Orban, all of them eventually plunder business. If you have uh, Bill Browder, who, um, whose business was plundered, uh, gone after by Putin, said, if you have a very good economic asset in Putin's Russia, the state will come after you. So these are things that are not, are not known enough. So at a time when we face the climate crisis and health and food, in, you know, food insecurity, the priority of authoritarian leaders is never public welfare, but always keeping themselves in power. They're completely self-interested. And those resisting around the world today know that strong men don't just endanger democracy, they are an existential threat to humanity. They also start wars, they, they're just, they will do anything to keep themselves in power. So I'm gonna take you on a, a tour of the authoritarian playbook um, because it's more important than ever to understand how strong men leaders think and operate and if you know the patterns that govern their behavior, and you can see who they are when they first appear, you can predict their actions and resist them with maximum uh, efficacy. And I've been able to, I was able to predict before Trump took office what he would do. I wrote uh, uh, an op-ed for CNN um, right before his inauguration saying, Trump is following the authoritarian playbook. Um, and then when Putin invaded Ukraine, two days later, I wrote an op-ed for MSNBC saying, this, this war is going to expose Putin's corruption. It's not going to go the way he thinks it is. I'm not a psychic. <laughs> it's because I have studied these people, and I, it's not very fun to live in their heads um, for, for years. It's not a, I did a lot of yoga, <laughs> a lot of reflection and yoga. But they're, quite pre they're actually quite predictable. Um, they, they are chaos agents, but they're predictable in their chaos, if that makes sense. So then we'll talk about the GOP because truly um, a lot of the behaviors we're seeing from the Republican Party, I, I see them, the only way to understand them is in an authoritarian context. And I'll just mention one very sad um, occasion uh, when they had the first GOP debate I mean, some of the, you probably saw it. And so Trump was not there. The guy hasn't been in power for several years, but it was like he was the all-powerful Saddam Hussein, like looking over them. So all of them but two, when they were asked if they would support Trump, they raised their hands and they said they would support him even if he becomes a convicted felon. And he's not even there, right? So, uh, including Mike Pence, he had his hand up and Trump targeted him from har for harm. So the only way to see, these are things that I've studied, I've seen in other countries, but they're not democracies. This is not what, this is not what democratic parties do. So we can put the next slide. Thank you. So how do you spot a strongman on the rise? Today, most of them come to power by elections. There is a little revival of coups in the world, but most of them come to power via elections. And here's the thing. They start using the authoritarian playbook before they get into power. It becomes a feature of their campaign to attack the press. And one of the main things is just an example. They profess their sympathies for violence while they're campaigning. And this is a way, like, normal politicians don't do that. Um, you don't stand, say, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone. That's not really the way to be popular, um, to talk about shooting anyone. But if you're a strong man and you're aiming to excite extremists and you have a very particular plan, that's what you do. You identify yourself with violence, you, that you could personally perhaps commit violence, and you have sympathy for that. Now, in countries with a history of dictatorship, um, they, may, they might hold up that violent past as a model. And Jair Bolsonaro did that in Brazil. Brazil had a horrible, you know, uh, more than 20 years of, of military dictatorship. Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, he talked during his campaign about throwing people out of helicopters and said he would do it again. So all of this had been going on, and um, then Trump comes and says, I could stand on Fifth Avenue. And what he was saying, which was terrifying, January 2016, so he did not have the nomination. He was saying that he was capable of violence, he, he sympathized with violence, 
and he would be loved by some because of violence. That's the not losing any followers part. So from the start, they tell us who they are and what they are going to do. So next slide, please. So um, I want to focus on personality cults for a minute. Um, every strongman, uh, a lot of them are extremely good at um, building a sense of um, bonds with their followers, and they use whatever the latest media technologies are of the day. So Mussolini did newsreels, Hitler had the radio, Trump had Twitter, um, Modi has a great Instagram, uh, an interesting Instagram account, and he used hologram uh, when he was campaigning the first time. And so one of the canons of a personality cult, which is so interesting, it has not changed for 100 years. You have to be a man of the people, so relatable, accessible, like you care about the people. But you have to be also a man above all other men. So you have to be both of those things somehow at the same time. And, and all of them who succeed know how to have this dual kind of identity. So the hologram is interesting because it, makes, it made Modi very godly. You're like everywhere and nowhere, like a celebrity, right? Um, and that way he was able to be at hundreds of rallies at the same time. So that's just one example. Um, Berlusconi in Italy uh, used satellite television. He owned TV networks. So he used satellite TV for the first time to be everywhere and nowhere. So, so these, are, these are things that, that continue to go on. Um, and they're very, very important. One of the questions people always have is, how do they get people to bond with them? And having a personality cult is, is really, really important. And that's for left wing, too, in, in communist countries. Um, so propaganda might seem to be all about noise, but silence is absolutely crucial to, to its operation. Strong men disappear people, and they disappear knowledge, whole fields of knowledge that conflicts with their goals. So Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet, he closed down philosophy departments, social science departments. Victor Orban has uh, banned gender studies. And we see here, uh, as in Hungary and other countries, banning books, uh, critical race theory, um, climate, everybody, every authoritarian goes after climate change science um, and LGBTQ uh, themes. This is, this is kind of the standard playbook. So silence. Some people can speak, and some people uh, are some, some themes, and people are not supposed to speak. And what they aim at by, and they use intimidation and threat, is to get you to self-censor. When you self-censor, you're doing their job for them. So that's the silence. OK, on to machismo, if we could have the next slide. So machismo is like the like, hyper-masculinity. It's like the connective tissue of authoritarianism. And um, women are as much the strong men's enemies as prosecutors and the press. So are LGBTQ individuals. And the persecution, or homophobic persecution, is a through line of um, authoritarian history. So there's a triad that of um, hypermasculinity, misogyny, and homophobia. This is the triad of authoritarian gender politics. And I just published a very long essay in my newsletter, Lucid, on this. I've been wanting to do for a long time um, about all three of those. So Mussolini was the first to strip off his shirt on camera and use his body uh, as an emblem of um, the nation's strength. And this caused a sensation. So he, he, there were many times where he was on camera without a shirt on. And we can move to the next slide. And then Putin, <laughs> he picks it up in, in a similar, for similar purpose um, almost 100 years later, using the body as an emblem um, and, and why is this important? We laugh at it, um, but um, strong men and authoritarians, they do not recognize any, um, any um, what's the word, um, division between their personal, their personal sphere and, and the people. They, private and public are the same for them. So one reason, for example, uh, Trump had uh, uh, highly classified national security documents in his bathroom, right, is because they're his. 
they, they don't recognize any separation. So the body, when they have their bodies, they actually are like in, they're in, they, they are um, incarnating the nation. So, so it's, it's deadly serious, and even though we laugh at it or we don't like to see it, it's part of um, the machismo, even those who don't strip their shirt off. It's very, very important. But this kind of brute force that they stand for is only half the story. And if we could have the next slide. So here's something so interesting. The charisma of the strongman is another duality. So he's strong, I alone can fix it. But they're also victims. They say they're victims. They have a victimhood complex that they are persecuted by, and it's always the same people, prosecutors, lawyers, the press. They have witch hunts against them. And guess who used the, the phrase witch hunt? Mussolini, Erdogan, um, Berlusconi. Berlusconi used to say, I am the Jesus Christ of Italian politics because he's the hero, but he's the martyr. So the things that you're hearing now in our country, it's like, I'm like, check, check. This is not new. They're not original. They're not original. Um, but this victimhood business, this martyr business, is very important because it, it also, by using that kind of um, religious rhetoric, it, it helps people who are their religious allies. That's very important. And, and we have evangelicals, Orthodox Jews, both groups, I'm just using Trump as an example, said that Trump was in power by the will of God. And Putin has the Russian Orthodox Church. They, they, all, have, they all have their people. But this martyr business, this victimhood business. So why do I have that weird um, photo of Bolsonaro up there? Because they also use their bodies to be vulnerable. So Bolsonaro, when he was running for office, he was stabbed. Um, and so he had to go to the hospital periodically for issues. Every time he went, this is an official, this is what's important. The, the Putin one, that was from the Kremlin. These are official personality cult products, I call them. So this is official uh, Brazilian president's office. So he, he would have himself depicted or even live stream in his hospital gown showing a little skin, but reminding people that he took the hit for the nation. That's, that's the victim stuff. So the thing about this vulnerability is it makes people feel very protective of them. So you get, you know, when people go to Trump rallies and they interview people and you have someone saying, oh, he's been through so much. We've, we've got, he's, you know, everyone's out to get him. We've got to protect him. We've got to be here for him. And they, they are devoted to him and they believe that he is in distress. Um, so that's, that's um, or rather this. So this duality is, is absolutely key. And this is all in the, to answer the question of why do people believe in these guys? Why do people bond with these guys? Okay, so corruption. So here, here's the thing. Most politicians who are um, under investigation or have charges against them, they don't want to run for office. It's just not a good idea, you know, because the, the journalists will probe, and why would you do that? Strong men are not most politicians. Strong men have to run for, they feel they have to run for office so they can get into power and shut down, uh, whether it's by taking over the judi judiciary, whatever they need to do, shut down the ability to have any charges uh, put to them at all or to, you know, to have their charges dismissed. So um, they often run for office and the number of people, this is just a partial list, who ran for office or faced charges or had indictments when they came into office, Berlusconi three times, Trump three times, Putin was under investigation in 1999-2000, uh, and most recently Netanyahu, who had uh, many charges, and so the minute he got uh, into office, he was laser focused on judicial reform, judicial reform which was meant to take away checks and balances. So that's, there's so, again, this is a pattern. This is a pattern. So strong men specialize in the unthinkable, in bringing the unthinkable into being. They innovate, and they're extremely creative in breaking the law, in lying, in violence, 
and it was a more, um, it wasn't a very pleasant part of the book to write or research, and I had that kind of menu in my head of uh, each person I focused on, what was their innovation for violence, like we know what Hitler's was, um, or what's their trademark, like Putin is poison, right? And these are the, pe these are the uh, people who, had, who have really well-developed regimes. They also know that making the government a refuge for criminals who don't have to be learned to be lawless hastens the corruption process. So how do you get people to lose their morals and their ethics? You, you put them with other people who have already lost their morals or never had any, honestly. So in 2019, the national legislators in Modi's India included 11 people who faced open cases for murder, and another 10 who had been convicted of serious crimes. So my, my line, and I've, I've said it on TV before, if you, you know, autocratic parties, they need criminals to come into the political elite. That's one reason uh, Republicans were saying, oh, the people who were, you know, at January 6th, they should run for office, right? Um, or we have George Santos. Like, why is he still there? Why? He's there because he's needed. This kind of person is needed if your party is going to be an autocratic party that depends on corruption and lying and threat. You've got to have people like that. It's, it's, so, so one thing you can watch um, is what kind of people are going out of the party, like the Liz Cheney's? What kind of people are coming in? And it's not a pretty sight, the people who are coming in. Or you watch how people um, transform themselves um, in the party, and, and we've seen that under Trump. So we can um, go to the next, oh, this is pardons. So another way they do is um, they all use pardons to free up criminals for government service, <laughs> right? And so, and so Mussolini, when he, as soon as he declared dictatorship, by the way, why did he declare dictatorship? It's because he was under investigation and he was probably going to go to prison. And he didn't know what to do, so he declared dictatorship. That's the first dictatorship, a right wing, was declared because he didn't want to have to get rid of an investigation. And then he pardoned all the black shirts, all the thugs who got him to power through violence. Um, and Pinochet pardoned all um, human rights abusers, and so Trump you know, was pardoning people and talks about, if he comes back, he will be pardoning pretty much everybody. And that way, you free up the lawless, um, they're indebted to you, and you free them up. Um, I know I'm not um, giving a very um, happy picture of human nature, but <laughs> that's just, that's just what, what it is. Um, the last thing about corruption, um, their, their governments are very chaotic. This is, again, debunking the myth that they're very, like, orderly and they bring order to society. Their governments are chaotic because as the more they stay in power, the more paranoid they get. And they want people to be loyal to them. So loyalty and not professionalism or expertise, that is what you have to show. And the loyalty quotient goes up and up. Until you end up on stage, you are actually running for president, but you're somehow raising your hand saying you're going to support somebody else, even if he's a criminal. That's what, <laughs> that's how you, that's what you can get to. So they make their um, governments, they, they surround themselves with sycophants, the lawless, I already said, and family members. So Orban, so, and I, I had to, um, I didn't have enough room, but I could have had like three pages on sons-in-law. <laughs> so Orban's son-in-law, he, he was under chart, the, the EU was investigating him for corruption, and then Orban stopped the investigation. Um, Erdogan's son-in-law is actually the, uh, he has the biggest drone factory in, it's like a really big really big uh, thing of drones, like new, very high-tech drones. Um, Mussolini ended up killing his son-in-law. That didn't go very well. And then, <laughs> because he vote, his son-in-law voted to get rid of him in a palace coup in 1943. But so when, so when uh, Jared Kushner comes, I was like, check, you know? <laughs> check. 
So now we go to violence. It's the last one I'm going to go through. Oh, no, this is important. I forgot this. So this is from, I urge you to read it, a very important New York Times article. It came out, I think, November 1st. Jonathan Swan, I think Charlie Savage, Maggie Haberman, about the kinds of lawyers they're looking for for a second Trump. Um, and I'll talk later about you know, what will happen with that. But I, I hope you can read it. They, they're looking for lawyers who are going to be um, more unethical and go further um, to do things than just the old-fashioned conservative law lawmakers or breakers and lawyers. Even though those people already helped to overthrow the government, what Trump has planned now has to go beyond that. So those people are no good anymore. You have to have uh, fanatics. Um, so that I thought that caught my eye. So this is how I feel like we're living through the unfolding of processes and dynamics that I have studied for other places and times. So when stuff like that comes you know, in my inbox, I'm like, oh, I get it. So, so for violence, um, should be, this is a quote by Putin, three ways of influencing someone, blackmail, uh, vodka, or the threat of murder. Um, or actually, you also do murder people, and then you send a message, because they've fallen out of windows. Um, think of all the people who have fallen out of a window or met with an untimely death since the war began. Right? So here's the thing about violence, um, and it's happening to us now. Since fascism, authoritarians have to change the way the population views violence. This is very important. Because we may have, a nat hopefully, a natural repugnance to violence against especially people we know, community members, um, or, or just people who think differently than us. Authoritarians have to change that so you will be willing to persecute people or not to speak up if you see other people persecuted. So from fascism onward, they change violence through, they, they have like a re-education they do. Um, into something that is perhaps patriotic, perhaps necessary, and even morally righteous. Um, because you're saving the nation, you're saving the white race, you're saving this or you're saving that. Um, and my report for the January 6th committee um, was partly about this, that uh, Trump since 2015 has been using his rallies as, ra I call them radicalization vehicles, where he keeps saying, like, the problem is nobody wants to hurt each other anymore. Or in the old days, you could beat somebody up and nothing would happen to you. Over and over, and what we're now like seven years into this. So, so that's just one example from today. But all of them have to change the way that the population views violence. Um, so the next slide, please. So then. We get, going back to this issue, I'm going to talk about the GOP now, I have seen that they've become an authoritarian party, and part of this process, they are becoming one, is renewing the political elite, like I was talking about before. Some people have to leave who, who are still for the rule of law, and other people have to come in, or they have to demonstrate that they are, um, that they, they are pro-violence, or they are willing to lie, so this is why you saw so many assault rifles in the 2022 midterm ads. This is just one of them. This was Dr. Oz. Remember him? Um, and he, this was from a 30-second commercial. And, and this, got, this was a commercial which earned him a victory in the primary. He didn't win. And he was seen with four different weapons in this 30-second commercial, including an automatic rifle. Now, he's gone from the scene. Who knows what he's doing? But you see guns. George Santos and others were wearing uh, lapels, lapel pins of guns in Congress. So this is just an example um, from the violence part of the playbook. So my background studying fascism let me understand the dangers that Trump and what he was doing with the GOP represented from 2015 on. 
And I changed my professional life. I was uh, writing a book on POWs in World War II. Um, I teach a lot of classes on war. And I put it aside. I thought, this isn't the time to do an academic book. And I started to give hundreds of interviews uh, a year, not just to educate the public, but to educate journalists, too, about the framework of authoritarianism. Um, because we had, I believe, we, we had in America a version of regional authoritarianism in Jim Crow. But we did not have a national experience of dictatorship like Brazil. Nor did we have um, decades of communism as in Hungary and Russia today. So, you know, the kind of can't happen here thing, we're especially prone to that. And, and many Americans also, I'm first generation, uh, you're, you're, you know, you have immigrants who came here because, um, like my dad, who was, uh, you know, considered a brown person from the Middle East, he, he had, um, you know, he had pre prejudice against him, so he came to the United States and he worked uh, with the military and found it much better. So you, you saw the United States as a beacon of freedom, as a place that you could, you could escape persecutions and how many people came here from communist or other dictatorships around the world. So it's very difficult for people to think that um, we might be in for the same, it, it looks different every time, but we might be in for the loss of our democracy. And it also means giving up um, these notions that are cherished about our national identity. So Germans, many Germans, in, and you know Germany in the 1930s, before, before Hitler, 20s and 30s, was one of the most advanced countries in the world for science, for medicine, for technology, graphic design, if you're into the arts, you know, uh, architecture. So they thought, how could this crazy, ranting lunatic really be a serious threat? Or Chileans, Chileans saw a lot of their neighbor countries have coups, and they thought, our army is for the Constitution. That will never happen to us. And um, then, it happened, and they had a military dictatorship for 17 years. So these are reflections that are very germane to us today. Um, and the GOP today, I, I want to um, stress how formative January 6 was. Now, it didn't work. But if you study coups, a failed coup can prepare another coup. And it, it broke so many taboos, sending Republican and Democrat lawmakers running for their lives. The GOP, I do believe, re emerged almost like drunk with the idea of possibility, that this could work, that they almost got away with it. So Marjorie Taylor Greene says publicly, um, if I'd organized the coup, um, there would have been more guns there, and it would have worked. Like, she just says stuff like that. Or Matt Gates, he goes to the Iowa State Fair to support his leader. And then, you know, everyone's eating their corn dogs, there's kids, and he's like, oh, by the way, you know, only force can save, you know, can change our country. So I hear these things like this is a coup mentality. So it's very interesting that in 2022, the GOP actually declared an official resolution the January 6th attack to be, quote, legitimate political discourse. Now, that's a hedge because it wasn't a discourse. It was, it was violent, right? It was, a, it was an act of violence. But this means they have internalized, I believe, the methods and the philosophy of January 6th. Um, that, that's why Mark, Matt Gates says only force can be used to bring, you know, to save Washington, that kind of thing. Or the example of election denial which everybody has to espouse now. The end game of election denial is to convince the US public that elections are not the way we should choose our leaders. That's the end game. And so sure enough, now you're hearing, oh, democracy is not really you know, the way. We're not, we shouldn't really be a democracy. Or we can always count on Tommy Tuberville to come forth. And somebody should like, do a study of him, because he's got a very his, his role is to say really outrageous things and seed, seed them, get them seeded in a way. So he says, 
we shouldn't have elections anymore. So drip, drip, drip. Uh, Michael Flynn recently said we, we shouldn't have elections. So it's, it's out there now, because that's the end game. Once the party has accepted election denial, it, you're, you're on the road. So um, next slide. So the other reason this is so harmful is that when a party has um, internalized these values and believes that, um, that you know, these lying and corruption and violence are the way that you should do politics, many Trumps are created or, or other people who realize that that's em embracing these things is the way to get ahead in politics. If the party, if this is the stage of the party, you have to be that way. So Mr. Unoriginal comes along and <laughs> all of a sudden is, he's pivoting, he doesn't like vaccines. He embraces violence. He's talking about violence all the time. We'll be slitting throats the first day, he says. Now he means we're gonna be firing uh, civil servants, but who says this? Guess who? Duterte. Duterte talks about this. Like, Democrats with a small d do not speak like this. So this is the danger that the system, that, that the Trumpian um, ideology, which is not just him, has never just been him, it, it replicates. You get these replicated people in the system. It populates the system. And then it's very hard to get rid of. Um, because it's been internalized. So, okay, so if Trump comes back, I'm sure you'll ask me more about this. Um, we really, just a few just concrete things. Um, we can't rule out that he would immediately try and have some kind of state of emergency. I wrote a uh, piece for MSNBC a long time ago about autocrats and states of emergency. Um, and so, in fact, we're hearing that, you know, there's advisors are saying he would like to have declare the Insurrection Act and so that he could use the military against protesters. So there, it's, it's some kind of state of excep exception or state of emergency would, there would be a, an attempt to find an excuse. And then there's also the purges, mass purges of the civil service. And the DOJ, of course, would be a prime target because the whole purpose of getting back into power is to create safety for himself so that he will never be accused of anything else again, right? Um, so in this sense, is fascism at our doorstep to go back to get to my conclusion? Well, yes, in that way, the turning the military against its own citizens, that was the original fascist thing, and that's certainly uh, with, with uh, coups, military coups, that's what you do. However, every period of repression is also a period of resistance to that repression. So I have a chapter on resistance over 100 years in Strongmen, and, and I also have a chapter about how these guys uh, fall, because fall they do. And we are living through a global renaissance of nonviolent protest. Um, dozens of countries since 2019 have either had the largest protest in their history, Israel's one, or the largest in decades, Belarus, Poland. Very recently, we had good, good outcome for democracy in Poland. We are part of this. The Women's March 2017 was the largest protest in history, only to be surpassed in a pandemic <laughs> by Black Lives Matter events, 20 million people. And now there are demographic analyses of who was, you know, multi-generational and multiracial, 20 million people. So we are part of this. And we are, as you saw, mobilized very recently in Ohio and other places to uh, protect reproductive rights. So you, if you could go to the next, we've got two more slides. Um, oh, this is actually, you can, you can skip that one. This was from Poland. So there, I see like exciting things happening. And state houses have become these um, you know, laboratories of democracy, of a renewed commitment to democracy, new alliances. So I thought this was a very big deal. 
when uh, the Tennessee House of Representatives, uh, Representative Pearson and Jones were ejected. Um, and this is exactly what the fascists would do, by the way, before the dictatorship was prepared, was uh, declared. They would eject people. Um, and so Representative Pearson said, I come from a long line of people who have resisted. And so we are ripe for a kind of, um, I would, a mega movement that integrates civil rights traditions, faith leaders. All of this has to come together. It's very difficult here because it's much bigger than Poland or Chile and other places. We're such a big country. But it's happening on the state level. That's what we can do. It's happening on the state level. And uh, last slide. And new alliances are being formed on the state level between activists and state legislators. So I thought this was, you know, when uh, Nikki Fried and Lauren Book were arrested um, uh, next to grassroots um, organizers because they were protesting uh, for abortion rights. So these are things that I see, um, and I'm also, you know, I look at America with the eyes of, um, abroad in a way. I turn, I get, I get lessons from abroad and I see what is applicable, what is new, what is exciting, what could be the future here. So to conclude, the history of authoritarianism is full of unwelcome surprises, like coups that come and you, you leave for school or work in a democracy and when you come home that democracy is gone. But we should never underestimate the, the desire and the will and the power for us to resist. And repression has always sparked resistance. And uh, as in Poland, our democracy can prevail. So I am an optimist. And one of my slogans is never, ever underestimate the American people. So we have a year to prepare to show the world that America, too, can shut the door on fascism and also help defeat it around the world. It won't be easy, but the stakes are far too high not to try. Thank you. This is certainly exciting to have in Sarasota a terrific thought leader like Ruth ben -Jiat. I mean, it's really incredible what she's teaching us, and now we have to mobilize and we have to follow because we are in the belly of the beast, and we have to do things locally and statewide to keep this MAGA movement down. So Ruth, thank you for being such a leader. I would say you are doing things already. You're doing a lot. Um, and I think we're here together, and that's very important. Another of my sayings is that things might be terrible, but we are in it together. <laughs> we, we do have uh, questions from our participants today, which we thank everybody for being here and participating. Uh, I don't see Dale. Where's Dale? If you do have a question on your card, take it to Dale, and if we have time, we'll certainly try to get to it. So, if I may. President Biden and the leaders in the Democratic Party are doing enough to raise awareness of the threat to our democracy posed by MAGA GOP. Um, I do. I, well, is it ever enough? Because uh, um, that's another question. But, you know, Biden came to office as in a very strong pro-democratic way. His first uh, press conference in March 2021 was all about defending democracy and restoring America's role in the world after the, after, you know, Trump tried to ruin America's kind of uh, profile in the world as a democracy. And so he has, he has pursued a very, very strong profile. The other thing that he's, a lot of the things that he's doing like um, the, these, these large-scale social programs, relief of debt, 
they are actually, they're, they're thinking in a long-term way. Um, they are actually designed to alleviate a lot of the economic and social and psychological stress that causes people to vote for authoritarians in the first place, that causes people to feel democracy isn't working. So he's done a ton of stuff. The problem is time, right? A lot of these things he's doing are long-term, big-scale projects. Uh, are they going to be enough to take effect? And can they counter the extremely intense psychological warfare that is delivered to America through Fox News? And, you know, like the economy, like a lot of people think irrationally that the economy is terrible because, and that life is bad, and that N New York City is, there's people killing each other in broad daylight all the time. And this is what people truly are led to believe. Um, so there's a perception problem that, as well as a time problem, but I'm, I think he's done a lot, a lot more than he gets credit for, for sure. Hitler's early success can be partly attributed to the backing of Germany's industrialists in 1933. Hitler promised to end Germany's democracy, protect their private property, wash unions, and imprison communists. Is the same pact that play in the U.S. today, and does it explain corporate ongoing support of Trump and the GOP? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this is one of the through lines of right-wing authoritarians that um, conservative business, financial elites, um, will back the person, often bring them in, and conservative political elites will bring them into politics, thinking that they're going to be able to either control them, and then they uh, end up with a big surprise, either as in Mussolini's case, he bankrupted the country uh, with his constant wars. Putin, one out of every six Russian businesses in 2018 had been plundered in some form. Um, businessman uh, Orban, uh, got um, 500 uh, owners of media properties to volunteer to give up those media properties for free <laughs> and donate them to a government allied foundation. These are big, you know, big media company owners. So the lesson is that um, I, I'm very frustrated that American business is not, um, and sometimes I'll speak to business groups, but they're not seeing that it is not in their interest to um, have authoritarianism and political violence are very expensive. Political violence wrecks business, it wrecks communities, just like gun violence, and they're allied. Um, it's not in their interest, uh, and it's not good for the nation, certainly, to have political violence and threat, so, but they don't seem to uh, want to hear that right now. Academics, historians, and the media have been reticent to call the MAGA movement a fascist political movement. Has their hesitancy left Americans unprepared for this phase of the assault on our democracy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I did not use the um, word fascist for Trump uh, for a long time. And I was one of the very, very first people to start speaking about him. Um, 2015 started writing about him and Bannon and all these people. And the reason I didn't is that when, when we think of fascism, we think of Hitler and more rarely Mussolini or even more rarely Franco. But we think of one party states, total control. And so, you know, the rare times I would use it, people would say, well, you're still there speaking out. You know, you're, you're, I'm supposed to be like, you know, the Fox News website says I'm like a radical leftist, right? So um, you're still speaking out, so what kind of fascism is this? So I decided not to use that word um, and use authoritarianism instead. Um, and is, we have to use some word, though, <laughs> that calls it out. And because this, ha this has indeed been a, a big problem, that people are not ready to hear that uh, it's scary to think about fascism coming or authoritarianism. Um, but, and they're not ready to hear because it also means maybe they'll have to do something about it. And either they don't know what to do or they don't, they, and there's all this political threat now. The reason that the Republicans are threatening everybody 
And by the way, you threaten you have physical threats. There's also uh, lawsuits. So CNN uh, was sued by Trump, and uh, there was a peace of mind. I was cited in on like page one of the complaint. I was not personally sued. It was CNN. But the idea is that maybe I'll see it in my interest to, to be quiet. Well, that didn't happen. Because um, it's just not going to happen. So <laughs> it's like. <laughs> but the, so, so that's why there's, there's like a, um, a mental block, in a way, to many people to, to having to, to, they don't want to name it. They don't want to name it. Um, and then it's a conscience thing, too. It is, it's very profound. Whoever asked that question, it's a very profound question. And the follow-up question right on that. Florida Representative Maxwell Frost repeatedly refers to Governor DeSantis as a fascist. Yeah. Yeah. Other critics have labored him, labeled him as the GOP authoritarian. In your mind, when is an authoritarian regime appropriately labeled a fascist regime. That's tough, I know. Yeah. Well, so I said at the beginning that I, so in, you know, if, we're, if I'm thinking, like, have my historian cap on, fascism and early communism were like the first stage of this system of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism at its, at its most basic is just when the executive overwhelms the other branches and dissidents are silenced and the media is taken over, but it's a continuum. Right? And even today, another thing that the reason that fascism can be confusing as a term is that today you don't ban elections and you don't, you, I mean, there are communist states that are one party states, but I mean, Orban or even Putin and Erdogan, who are horrible uh, despots, they have opposition parties, they hold elections. And so fascism doesn't convey that, right? Yet there are personalities. Um, Trump and uh, DeSantis among them, who are bullies, who, who embody a lot of the fascist values and the fascist style. So I actually um, have called, including on TV, um, your governor, uh, the Florida fascist. It's, it's alliterative. I, I have called him that. Because he's been, he's been very, very clear about what he, you know, bullying the, his, his peers, the House of Representatives. He's, he's kind of activated the whole playbook, but in his personal um, way of being, he, he's very fascistic. Um, and so I'm not, of course, I know that about Maxwell Frost, and he's, he's right to use that term. Um, it depends, you know, it depends what you're, I'm a scholar, and I, um, I, I just, I like to anticipate what the confusion could be by using certain terms, um, so. That's a terrific answer. So, on the optimistic note, what recommendations would you make to pro-democracy activists wanting to stop Florida's fascist political movement? Yes. Um, you know, I think um, there's some, there's a lot of the, the lessons that come down to us from um, a century of resistance or things that are going on now um, are hard to apply here, whether it's the federal or state level, because we don't have a multi-party system, because unity is very important. Now, we do have these people who have appeared as third-party candidates, um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think that's, a, I think that it's really important to have one can think that Biden's maybe too old or not like certain things about him, but until somebody truly, who's a true star with charisma, who can excite everyone and have a wave of um, unbelievable support sufficient to beat Trump, um, we, we have Biden, and it's very important to, to vote for him. Uh, <laughs> Now, one, one difficult thing about this is that when we're in a crisis, and part, I have to say that part of the reason people are voting for these authoritarians generally in the world is not just that they seduce them and they know how to do this and that, and they play on fear and you know, great replacement theory, but democracy is, has not really delivered for many people. They feel disaffected. 
Um, and so it can be tempting to say, well, Biden's the establishment. This is the moment when we're in crisis. It's like a revolutionary way of thinking to just vote for someone else, right? But I, my priority, my, you ask my counsel, we are really like, it is like 1932 here. Again, now I'm not saying that we're gonna have a Reichstag fire and, and a Hitler. It's just every, every place is different. Everyone looks different, everything is different every time. But it's just, we don't have the luxury of experiments right now. We have to get, we have to keep Trump out because if he gets in, it, he will never leave. Um, and, and he will, from the very beginning, remember the chaos and the engineered uh, confusion, the blitzkrieg when he first got in, like the so-called uh, Muslim travel ban and all that, this would be like times 10, um, which is why he's ta they're talking about the Insurrection Act. Uh, it, it wouldn't be good, let's put it that way. So it's very important to keep him out. Um, and a lot of the things that I would recommend are um, designed for that. Now, that I started talking about the nation, and the question was about Florida. But um, getting people to vote, that's one of the most important things you can do. How, I mean, I'm so haunted that, you know, like 80 million people don't vote. If they were ever going to vote, it's now. <laughs> it's like people think they're, they, some are cynical. They think their vote doesn't matter. It matters. So that's one thing you can do. And I guess the other thing is um, try and read. If, all of us know people who are uh, what I call in the disinformation tunnel. We all have like, you know, family members or people, you just can't talk to them. Every expert on these things says you have to try and talk to them. You can't, do, do not shame them or judge them. It's very hard. My mother became radicalized during the pandemic in England. Uh, and I, you know, I confess I hung up on her sometimes because I, I just, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't deal. But that's not the right thing to do. So reach out to people. What's the alternative? You, you want to feel that you've done everything possible um, to, to reestablish. This is the bridge building. So voting, bridge building, um, th those are things you can do wherever you are. Do you mind a few more questions? No, I'll okay? I'll, I'll, I don't yeah. want to overwork you. I mean, oh, no, I, I, it's very important to, okay. to be here. Many reject comparisons of what's happening here in the U.S. and the events in Nazi Germany in the 1930s with the, they do, with the ongoing GOP assault on the transgender community consisting of hate speech, discriminatory, discriminatory laws in yeah. red states, and intimidation by the Proud Boys at drag events, is the comparison now justified? So um, the through line of pretty much all authoritarian states I know about is homophobia. Even even uh, like Gaddafi in Libya, who was a horrible dictator, 42 years he was there. He actually, at the beginning, he did a ton of things for women because he, he was a leftist revolutionary. He gave them education, he gave them property rights, but he immediately um, persecuted LGBTQ people. So now, um, and the way that, that propaganda works is that um, often you pick a group who that's very tiny numerically, like the Jews. Uh, um, what were they, like 1% of the population, right? It, that's not exact, but very small. And most people didn't know any Jews, which makes it easier to have them become the enemy. So I see a little of this with transgender individuals who are a very small subset of LGBTQ communities. And they have been singled out. Um, and persecuted, including in laws, and they're also, of course, part of broader laws, homophobic laws. But this is part of the mechanism. So you can compare it not only to, I mean, you know, Hitler sent gays to Dachau and then eventually to the, the camps in Poland and elsewhere. Um, every time and every place unfolds differently. But this is one of the most, um, sinister and awful things that's going on now. You can say that. Before we uh, go ahead with other questions, I would like to introduce uh, Dale Anderson.
Dale is a, he leads the group Choose Democracy Now, one of our co-sponsors, and Dale has just been, to put it bluntly, working his butt off to make this event a success. So please, let's give Dale a big hand. Okay. So bear with me if I can't uh, read these, but uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can here. I'm sorry. Could you speak briefly about the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 and the possible likelihood of such a plan being put into action? Yeah, that's, that's uh, so, you know, they mean business. Uh, there's an army of people uh, who have learned from Trump won um, that they, they, Trump did a ton of stuff to the civil service. He, he had, like one of, a former amb ambassador described what happened to the Department of State under Trump won as a hostile takeover. The EPA was decimated. Um, so, so they did m much more than people actually know or want to acknowledge. But they also learned from what they weren't able to do. So the Heritage Foundation has made itself the umbrella of 70, 70 organizations, an army of people who are working for this Trump 2025, which is autocracy. Let's just be clear. That's what Trump 2025 is. But it's focused on the civil service, the judiciary, purging, again, create, from my point of view, creating the conditions so Trump will be safe. And um, so the judiciary and all the other, um, you know, civil service, so they'll have these mass purges. And a very frightening quote was, um, um, was made by this guy, Russell Vought, or Voigt, I think, V-O-U-G-H-T. He was the head of Trump's Office of Management and Budget. And he said that they were looking for pockets of independence to seize them. So they're doing a vast vetting and studies and analytics. This is why there's an army of operatives working already to see how they can um, dismantle our democracy as soon as they get in. That's what's going on. And so, the, so independence of, of the judiciary and of civil servants is the bedrock of democracy. So, and also the language, I pay attention to language. He says we're going to seize them. We're going to get rid of those. That's like coup language, also. So that's that's what the that's the Trump 2025. There are other dimensions to it, but that's the centerpiece. Um, because every dictator knows you have to it, your bureaucracy has to be able to pass all your like rubber stamp all your stuff, and you like you have to be able to if you're persecuting people, you need paperwork. This is Hannah Arendt talked about. Uh, you know, like desk killers, people who wore suits uh, and did the paperwork behind the killings. Um, so that's, or here we don't have to talk about killings, we could talk about mass detention uh, or mass deportation. But you need the bureaucrats. That's what Trump 2025 is about, finding those people. That's the lawyers, too, that slide I, show, I showed before. How can we get sufficiently lawless people number one, in, and how can we get ethical people who are not loyal out? That's, that's the mechanism. How do you see the role of vigilantism in our current struggle with fascism in the United States? Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad somebody brought that up, and that's why I said also that fascism started as a decentralized militia movement. And it was, uh, and Mussolini's militia was just one, and then he took over them. Um, this has been a project of Trump since the very beginning. Um, he started signaling to militias and extremists uh, already in 2015. In early in 2016, uh, at one point, 62% um, of all of his posts on Twitter were either retweets or um, expressing sentiments that were white uh, supremacists. And then there was, of course, as you know, um, 
Charlottesville. So he has worked very, very hard to um, leave the door open and create a big tent for all racists, all extremists, including malicious. And if you look at the states with an eye from abroad, the fact we have tolerated these anti-government extremists, all of these militias, all of these uh, people is just insane. Like these constitutional sheriffs, these sh who, what other country would have a, a sheriffs that don't recognize the, like the, law, the law? That doesn't make any sense. It's just waiting for, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge weakness, right? If you think in terms of destroying a democracy. So they've been very important and now, as you well know, the Proud Boys have been mainstreamed, right? And so some of them are in local government. Um, also Trump kicking off his, uh, his presidential campaign at Waco. That was a small signal, right? <laughs> he went exactly there, and then he went to the gun store. So this is not subtle. So Trump is, is souping up uh, his um, embodiment of the values of extremism. And that's also why I showed you Dr. Oz, who I think like never shot a gun in his life, but <laughs> there he was, um, because that's what you gotta do. Okay, I apologize, but I could not read the last question. So we're going to thank Dr. Ben Jiat for a wonderful talk. It's so much more. Thank you all. We just hope and pray that we can follow the leadership that you're showing. And I think we have the people in Sarasota to give it a good shot and cause some indigestion for the MAGA beast. Absolutely. Thank you.